30s, and there was not a single samurai among them. 150 articles were devoted to civil rights, and the power of sovereignty was vested in the people, not the monarch. When most people think about the history of that time, all they think about is how Japan's leaders tried to modernize from above, down onto the people, trying to limit freedom and equality. But in response to that, the documents I found in that warehouse showed that the Japanese people were trying to modernize from the bottom up, trying to work towards greater democracy and greater freedom. Since Irokawa's discovery, more village constitutions have been unearthed all over Japan, proof that by the late 1870s, democratic ideas were sweeping the countryside. Pressure was building on the Meiji leaders to open up the government. It's in this context that, without doubt, the most important of these, these government leaders, Ito Hirobumi, uh, in charges, in trusts himself, he wrote his own orders and put the emperor's seals on them, to write a constitution. That he buys off the opposition by promising them that within a decade, there will be an assembly of elected representatives of the people. Ito's problem, then, is to give them what he's promised, but to give away as little as he possibly can. Above all, not to give them genuine democracy. By this time, Ito has discovered his idol, Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor, the man who has unified Germany in 1870 and has put together a peculiar form of government. It's a government in which neither the parliament nor the king actually exercises real authority over the imperial bureaucracy. The bureaucracy basically does what it wants to do, and it does so in the name of national welfare, of, uh, of, uh, of strengthening the state. Ito took the Prussian constitution and adapted it to the Japanese political stage. Japan's classical puppet theater. The puppet handlers are in full view. But dressed in black, they seem to fade away behind the colorful puppets. In the same way, Ito and the oligarchs seem to disappear behind the gaudy symbols of a new parliament and constitution. Politicians came and went. Ito and the oligarchs stayed in place, discreet, but at center stage, guiding the action. Perhaps the key element in this is the position of the emperor. The emperor is made absolutely sovereign. The constitution is bestowed by the emperor to the people. The importance of this is not that it actually gave power to the emperor, it meant that the emperor's advisors are basically beyond the law. But despite the efforts of Ito and the oligarchs, elements of true democracy slowly began to seep into Japan's parliamentary system. The Meiji Constitution gradually became the property of the Japanese people. It happened gradually, but even in the Meiji period, by the end of the period, a geisha whose client had not paid was capable of saying to him, he's unconstitutional. It simply wasn't done to contravene what were then known as the rights and duties of the Japanese subject. Oh. 